Well, hello, welcome. I'm Joshua Greenbaum, and we are here to present a wonderful Google Hangout uh, sponsored by the IEEE Computer Society. Our topic today is 3D, 3D printing. Uh, this is a, um, a Hangout uh, that is coming to you in anticipation of a event coming up uh, later this spring. Um, in person, rock stars of 3D printing. Uh, it will be uh, here in San Francisco, uh, March 24th. Uh, what we're doing today is giving you a little taste of uh, where we're going to take this uh, event and what uh, the themes and ideas, and of course some of the people who are going to be there presenting live on the 24th of March here in San Francisco. Um, what I'd like to do first is g actually get started uh, by having some of uh, our speakers um, introduce, well, I'll, let me introduce our speakers, and then we're going to get right right into some topics and interesting ideas about 3D printing. And uh, we're also, bear with us, we're working with Google Hangout. It's having a fun Google Hangout kind of day today. Uh, so some things are, are going to be a little interesting, including I hope my voice will actually improve as, as we go along. So uh, let me introduce in no particular order. Uh, our speakers, we have Cliff Waldman. Oh, sorry, Waldman. He's the Director of Economic Studies for the Manufacturers Alliance for Productivity and Innovation. Um, I'll, I'll read, I'm going to excerpt his rather interesting resume here. But Cliff is the Director of Economic Studies for the Manufacturers Alliance for Productivity and Innovation and a uh, speaker on very interesting topics, macro and microeconomic issues. He's authored a number of papers and, and on interesting passing topics like the Chinese economy as well. And he's been directing a large project for the Southern Governors Association that has analyzed the potential for advanced manufacturing cluster development in the American South and that comes to us as an expert on the, the, the big and small issues relating to uh, 3D printing we're going to talk about today. Um, over on what is my far left, it's uh, Brian David Johnson. He's a futurist and director. Uh, he runs uh, Future Casting and Experience Research at Intel, which has just got to be a fascinating title. Um, he is, I'm told, sporting winter beard today. Uh, if you look him up, I think, on our, in fact, on our uh, website, you'll see that he's got a rather clean shaven look most of the year, but it's winter, so he's, he's here yet showing us a lovely beard. So he's, he, the future is uh, Brian David Johnson's business. That's what his resume says, and we're going we're gonna to hold him to that. Um, as a futurist at Intel, his charter is to develop an actionable 10 to 15 year vision for the future of technology, which has got to be an unbelievably complicated job. Um, and he uses ethnographic field studies, technology research, trend data, and even sci fi uh, to help provide Intel with this kind of guidance. And we're going to get some guidance from Brian today as to uh, what's going to happen in 3D printing. Brian Gaff is our, is our last but not least uh, hangout participant today. Brian, he is a partner of McDermott, Will, and Emory LLP. He's an IEEE senior member, which gives him a special, uh, <coughs> special welcome from us here today. Uh, and he's a partner in the Will, McDermott, Will, and Emory law firm in Boston. He was an engineer at Hewlett Packard. Uh, after that, he became a lawyer. He focuses on complex patent litigation and has handled cases in federal courts throughout the U.S. And he works a lot in the IP world. And there's no, I think, more interesting place for the for an IP discussion to take place then actually uh, here in the 3D printing world. So with that, I want to um, get, get started here. And what we, what we like to do when we, um, at the Computer Society, do one of these rock star uh, 3D hangouts is we uh, do a survey uh, uh, to the participants, you folks who are here on this, um, online with us today. And we ask, you know, in this case, we asked we asked one particular question. Ours today, ours for this hangout was, what do you think are the ten hottest trends for three D printing for the year? And uh, we got some very interesting results. And I really want to start with, actually, I don't want to go to the most highly rated response first, but I want to go to start with two of the responses we got that were potentially contradictory. Uh, basically, we had uh, second second place was occupied by two separate responses that got uh, pretty much the same number of responses. And um, when asked which do you think are the hottest, 10 hottest trends for 3D printing this year, um, an equal number of people said that um, this is the year we go from hype to reality, and this is the year of the 3D printing car. 
So I pose that as our first uh, discussion point, uh, hype and reality, 3D printed cars. Where are we? Let's start with our, our, our actual papers, Brian David Johnson. What's and and please take your mute off. Don't forget. Yes, tell us. Uh, hype reality. Is there such a thing as a 3D printed car in anyone's near future? Um, where are we today? Well, I think it's interesting, really, how far we've come. Um, you know, if you just look, you know, five, ten years ago, we wouldn't even be having this conversation, even in in this way. <clears throat> and so, I think if you look at sort of where we are, the state of the art for 3D printing is right. Right now, we're just in, I think, the early Gs for their jet engines. We certainly have people printing you know, 3D um, art and people beginning to do work, and even from a manufacturing standpoint. So I still think we're beginning to, to, to dabble. Um, I, it, for me and, and a lot of the, the folks who I do work with, I think there's a really interesting correlation you know, between 3D printing and the desktop printing. Um, that came so many decades ago. You know, before you know, you would have a big printer and a print shop that would live over there, and it was completely far away. And then, as you had the technology and the materials, the ink and the paper get better and better and better, it moved closer and closer. Right? You had the local print shop, the local university had the printer. Then it got a little bit closer, and then it started to sort of get into the neighborhoods and then into your homes. So I think now we're just beginning to say, well, what are the really practical ways that we can use it? I think for 3D printing, a lot of folks are how it works, and they'll say, well, how do we turn it into a, a real business about when we start thinking about 3D printed cars, because there's some, some issues around strength of materials, is there's some really exciting things going on in materials development. So we're not just 3D printing uh, plastic anymore. We're not just 3D printing uh, wood or 3D printing wood products or 3D printing metal. We have the ability to 3D print multiple different substances. And for me, that's where I think where it gets really interesting. Cliff Waldman, from your standpoint, you're, you're lo you look at some of these issues in the manufacturing world's position. Give us your, your sense. Hype, reality, where are we? Is this we talk about 3D printing as the you know the next American manufacturing revolution. Um, I've heard you know various attempts to to make it you know, today and interchangeable parts and the assembly line. Those kind of revolutions. Where are we from your standpoint, and, and how does this you know? It's almost the opposite of what Brian David Dunn is saying. How does this scale up? And scale? Does this become a 3D car? What does this mean for traditional automotive manufacturing? Well, I think history shows that once a disruptive technology makes its grand entrance, as 3D has, has clearly done, hype to reality is an evolutionary process. I think rather, you know, there's been a lot of stories, a lot of public discussion about 3D printing cars, 3D printing houses, 3D printing uh, 3D printers, 3D printers that are cloning themselves. But I think the important thing to realize is that we are starting to, to get a sense that we don't even have full, expansive knowledge yet of what this technology can do. But we do know, as, as Brian said, that because it can do multiple things, and because it's flexible, and because it, it's something that can so facilitate our, our, our imaginations and our sense of design, it's going to fundamentally change the supply chain, not not of all manufacturing, but of certain manufacturing. Manufacturing in certain industries that are going to be able to make use of 3D printing is, not, is going to change fundamentally from the production of goods to the collaboration with end user customers on design. It's going to be, it's going to be a different kind of sector um, where this kind of technology can be most fully used. So whether it's cars, whether it's houses, we know the supply chain is going to make this very different. Innovation is going to take a, a higher role in certain supply chains. Production is going to take a lower role. But to my mind, that's the key point for understanding the real implications of 3D printing right now, particularly for manufacturing. Well, that's a, um, a great segue to, um, to ask our, our third panelist, Brian Gap. If, we, if we've got this shift, 
happening in um, in the manufacturing and supply chain and production modalities. What does this mean in terms of intellectual property? Where does this take us uh, from? You know, in that in that regard, and again, we really sort of sit back and relax and say, you know, let this revolution come because we're 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 ready. We've got we've got the the, the legal, juridical, regulatory side, or as I'm probably going to guess, you're going to say, no, it's we got a long way to go before I. Uh, interesting question. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, one of the things I think you're going to have to face up to is that the people who have intellectual property rights and any of the designs that could ultimately come out of a 3D printer, and I'm talking about uh, anything that might um, uh, be be copied from another source, not something that's originally um, uh, developed by the 3D uh, printer end user. Uh, to the extent a lot of the traffic in in 3D printing um, output comes from copying other um, other products, trying to find alternative sources of supply, for example, for your supply chain. I think you're going to start seeing some reluctance on the part of the people who are the actual innovators of those products that you're trying to copy. They will likely have some type of IP protections in their products and if they start getting wind of others trying to enhance their supply chains for example by um, copying their products I think you're going to start seeing some pushback from that so one of the interesting things I think is is going to start raising its head is to what extent the IP rights holders um, uh, feel comfortable with allowing their products to be uh, exploited, as it were, through 3D printing technology? Are they going to put up a, uh, a significant uh, re uh, uh, wall of resistance to that, or are they going to facilitate uh, that type of, um, uh, uh, of exploitation by maybe putting in place a, a licensing scheme that is uh, reasonable or low cost or something that can be easily navigated? I mean, is, is it going to be a, sort of a, a fight first mentality or is it going to be a mentality where, well, this seems to be coming and how do we maybe go with the flow and uh, protect our rights and, and perhaps get some compensation for it? I mean, is the is the music industry our our example for good and bad? I mean, we, we saw this huge disintermediation with digital digital music and digital downloads. Where on the one hand, you know, there's there's certain bands and, and individuals who are able to actually um, leverage that ability and, and publish their own music, but the industry as a whole changed dramatically, and and no, it could neither sustain its own margins as as a result of this individual ability to. Pro to Create and, and 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 procreate music, uh, as as well as it was you know unable to to actually deal with again the IP protection issue of how, how do you you can have all the licensed regimes you want, but if I can you know go to an after server and download all the music I want, what 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 does happen um, in the legal world? And what I think of three D printing, I mean, and you know I think there's definitely a problem with. You know, the question of you know, is, is is the design is patenting the design enough to protect the patent holder? Is there something else that has to happen? Something like what we do with DVDs, where we try to restrict the ability of DVDs to be played in different ways in order to protect the copyright or, or trademark owner. How, how is this? Is there any way to predict how this is going to settle settle down? Because back to Brian David's point, if we don't, you know, the big fear is that. If we don't open this up, it doesn't become as, as freely available, and then suddenly we are going to be you know, restricting what should be a pretty valuable change in, in society from, from taking, taking flight as much as it could. I think that's right. I mean, the analogy to the recording industry is not a bad one. Um, there was a, a, a long period of time where the recording industry was very reluctant um, to uh, um, adapt, as it were, to some of the newer technologies and took a very forceful approach in pursuing uh, individuals who, as you said, just downloaded materials from servers and so forth. And uh, that, that was a long-fought battle, and uh, it continues to some degree even today. But I think uh, maybe just because of survival reasons, uh, that industry adapted to some extent 
and has taken advantage of other platforms. Of course, they have put other protections in place to try and, and, and uh, control to some extent their their IP, the proliferation of the IP, and you know through digital uh, rights management and so forth. But um, I, I think the 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 core a core issue here is going to be what can the IP holders do or what will they do that could potentially either uh, hamstring this industry that's trying to get off the ground by locking down their IP, pursuing uh, allegations of infringement and, and so forth, and or uh, do they take a more um, cooperative approach and recognize that there might be some sort of a paradigm shift here and with this new technology that's become available do they look at it from a more cooperative approach how how what steps can they take that will perhaps further this industry and maybe generate revenue for them uh, ultimately downstream it's i think it's really very early to tell where this is going um, I, I don't think uh, it, the technology has reached that level of um, commonality uh, among uh, consumers where the IP holders are perceiving a threat uh, to their to their uh, protected products. But uh, you know, once that widget that uh, becomes very common and uh, it, it's a high volume item. Uh, starts getting produced by consumers all over the place, then you might find the IP holders start to pick up and uh, and take notice of that. And, and not just and not just IP holders, but there's going to be a um, you know there's going to be a whole other group of, of 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 interested parties involved in this. Brian David Johnson, you wanted to jump in. Please. Yeah, I wanted to kind of agree with uh, with Brian and then add some things to that. I mean. We have to be careful that we don't co combine things that don't necessarily need to be combined. So at, once, at one hand, you've got this technology. You have this ability. And the technology is simply a tool, right? The technology is a hammer. And a hammer is really great, but a hammer is really interesting when you use it to build a house. So you've got this, this new technology, this new tool. And to Brian's point, it's early days. We're still trying to figure out what can we do with this, with this new thing. And we are in an, an age of, of experimentation. I think we're seeing a lot of that. And that experimentation is not only the experimentation with um, what it can do, but it's the experimentation around IP laws, around ownership. It's also experimentation around what consumers, what, what people would want to do, and then also from a business standpoint, what businesses can we can we make out of this? But I think when I start thinking about where these things might go in the future, for me it's always about intent or optimization. And I think Brian would agree. It's what do you want to do, right? There's there's a whole wide swath of 3D printing that will have nothing to do with IP and ownership and the people using it however they want to use it. There'll be a whole amount of, inno of innovation when it comes to business, and that's why I like you using the example of um, of the music industry. Where if you look at what's happened with the music industry, you know you started off as you said it started turning digital, but now you have some business models that you would have never dreamed of before. You have like the business models of things like Pandora or things like Spotify, which even at the very beginning in the time of Napster, those were those viable. What would those business models be? That it's an interesting confluence, if you will, of the, what the technology affords us. The technology allows us to do certain things. There's what consumers actually want, what they'll actually pay for or not pay for or use or what they'll do, and then also what makes it a viable business. So how do we actually make it sustainable? Because, you know, these things cost money. 3D printers cost money and the materials cost money. So that's kind of what I keep an eye on is where those three things actually come together. Well, let me and, 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 and Cliff, I want you to you're next. I just I was I forgot to remind our viewers that you can ask questions of this illustrious panel and to do so go on to Twitter. Our handle is 3D Rockstars and send your questions, comments, um, you know, mash notes, whatever you want to that uh, Twitter address. We'll feed them through here. And if it's good stuff, uh, we would definitely like to bring that bring that into the uh, hangout as we proceed in Cliff. Take the ball because I know you got a lot to say about where we're going here. Well, let, let me take uh, some of Brian's comments um, and, and sort of flesh them out from the uh, the economic context of entrepreneurship. And I've said this in other forums too. One of the things, 
in terms of the price of 3D printers, one of the things we know is that new technologies are always highest priced at birth. We will learn, we will become more efficient. The industry will become more efficient at producing 3D printers. As it does, we will see the same that we saw with the calculator, the same that we saw with the PC. We will sort see increasingly less expensive 3D printers. One of the things I am hoping that will do over time is it will spur entrepreneurship. Now, the U.S. is badly in need of entrepreneurial activity. Business startup activity, generally speaking, uh, has been falling off since the late 1990s, and it all, and has been falling off specifically in manufacturing. So what I think can happen is that the 3D printer can become the fax machine of, of, of this age, where somebody with an interesting idea who wants to be, participate in a manufacturing supply chain in their area can buy a, 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 a relatively inexpensive 3D printer and use their imagination to, uh, to participate. And I think that would, be, that would be a great, in theory, that becomes a great value added to our economy, to our manufacturing sector that we very much need. But at the same time, I recognize that my, my two distinguished colleagues on the panel uh, would say that there are a great many IP problems. Um, intellectual property, cybersecurity problems associated with it. So given the, the power of entrepreneurship but the problems of having well diffused 3D printers with a lot of creative pro uh, problems, it suggests to me that we really need a public strategy to maximize the economic value but minimize the IP and legal dangers that uh, all this suggests. It all suggests to me that we really, as, as a country, for this kind of technology and for others, we really have to think about how we maximize the benefits, minimize the harm. So that, that's what I want to say. I wanted to flesh out the framework. Okay, so wait. So, if I want to, so yeah. in interest, yeah. so in interest of, of always having a, a good uh, a good panel, um, <laughs> that's that's scary. But go ahead. So one of the things I wanted. So I want to both agree, well, disagree with Cliff, and then I'll eventually agree with him. So I don't actually think there is a problem, and Brian might jump up and, and yell, I don't actually think there's a problem around IP rights when 3D printing. You know, I think well, that... I'll jump it, up and yell, but... Uh, yeah, yeah. But wait, but the, idea, the idea is what do you want to do with it? I think one of the things that makes 3D printing really, really interesting is it pushes us to challenge the original notions of what IP and what ownership looks like. Much like in the, in the, in the music industry, in the publishing industry, as, as technology has come along, it challenges our existing notions of, of, of ownership. Now, it becomes then a question, I think that's what becomes sort of difficult. Now, many people think that ownership remains the same and should remain the same thing, and that's fine that they can do that. But I also think what makes it really interesting is there's a whole generation of creators, there's a whole generation of entrepreneurs who are, are creating, are using 3D printing, are using open source hardware and software, who have a radically different understanding of what IP looks like. Um, and I th do think there's room for both to live, but that's one of the things I think that's exciting about 3D printing is it's also challenging the very notion of ownership. Brian Gass, you want to take that and run with it? Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, I mean, ownership, ownership is a nice, it's a nice concept that we have this loose definition of ownership or evolving one, but you know, I, I certainly know plenty of people in the music industry will go back to that. You know who are out of job, who don't don't have a livelihood, who have really been disintermediated to a non-existent as a result of this loose definition of ownership. Well, to go back to the to the original statement, which is that the 3D printing doesn't in itself create a, an IP issue. It's how you use that. I, I mean, I think that's a, a pretty straightforward and, and accurate statement. Uh, you have the tool. You're you're limited only by your imagination and how you're going to use it. Um, the area um, where you clearly wouldn't have a problem with regard to ownership is if you use it to craft your own figurines or other types of items that are purely something that are uh, uh, products of your creative genius. Uh, the issues that will really start rubbing up against an IP framework is when you start using it perhaps very innocently with no real intent to infringe 
but you start using the technology because, for example, you need to replace a part for a product that you have that might uh, need repair, or you've seen uh, a particular toy or some other type of figure that you'd like to replicate and have on your mantelpiece. Um, to the extent you do that and these particular items are covered by some type of IP protection. It could be a copyright, it could be a, a trade dress, it could be a design patent, something more aligned with a physical, a, the physical appearance of an object rather than its functionality. Um, nonetheless, if you start doing that, um, technically you could be an infringer. Now, the question becomes whether a company that holds the IP rights to whatever you just produced is going to invest the significant time and resources to pursue you for, uh, for that infringement. If it's a one-off type of infringement, uh, it's probably unlikely that you're going to be pursued. Again, using the recording company analogy, uh, the, the folks that were generally targeted were the large-scale downloaders, not the person that just uh, all, did a one-off download of a copyrighted uh, song. So, hey, can I, Brian, I'm going to interrupt you. Said because sure. in Europe, that's actually not not the case. Uh, I have a colleague in Germany whose son downloaded. <clears throat> uh, I think it was literally half a dozen songs, and he they have a whole they have a whole system there for prosecuting these people and uh, the lawyers who specialize in reducing the fine. And he got out with he had to pay a couple thousand euro fine for a handful of illegally downloaded. Song. So I, th I think you know it can be it can be taken to a certain scale in the digital world it, because of the traceability as well from a technology. Well, yeah. I, I, again, there was a phase in the U.S. I'm not, I, oh, I don't want to address the European law issue, but there was a phase in the U.S. where individuals were being pursued, um, and that that phase uh, was in. Uh, quite a few years ago and, and they were getting small nominal uh, um, uh, fines if you want to call it that or, or uh, they would be given offers to settle at a, at a small few thousand dollar type of level and I think a lot of that was mainly just to uh, provide a public deterrent for people trying to uh, download even on, on a small scale basis but the real damage that a copyright or, or any IP holder is going to uh, arguably suffer is going to occur at larger scale infringement so and, and there's always a business decision about how you want to um, approach uh, uh, charges of infringement what's your strategy going to be Do you you want to have a particular kind of public persona? Do you want to send a message? Uh, there's a whole bunch of, of things that, that go into the mix. But um, coming back to our original point, and maybe just talking along the edges of it here, I think some thought has to be given, at least at the IP holder level, is how to confront this, this reality that you are going to have folks um, perhaps taking 3D images of an object that they like and replicating it for their own use. Now, if it's, um, if it's a, an issue where it, it can be uh, tolerated and maybe uh, um, have a licensing structure that is uh, a very low-cost structure, uh, then maybe that will tend to help the industry uh, develop. Right? It takes away the threat of, of litigation or, or uh, a fear of infringement if people know that they can, in fact, go out and, and, and uh, image other objects or replicate them as they see fit. And maybe they only have to pay 99 cents for it or something like that, a very nominal fee. So it's not an issue. Um, and, it, and I think it would send a message that the industry is promoting uh, 3D printing and the technology uh, at large because it's removing this this fear or litigation related ro uh, roadblock to it. Now whether the industry wants to take that approach and there are arguments uh, against taking that approach, sure, but I think that's something the industry's got to get its head wrapped around. How is it going to address what might be, be an inevitable um, uh, use of this technology? And, and how they address it's going to, I think, in, in large part dictate um, how smooth a road uh, 3D uh, printing technology will be traveling on as it tries to get into more and more consumers' homes. So, Cliff, what, what I mean, this is 
right up your your alley. What are they going to do? What can you know? And it's not just manufacturing. We have huge distribution supply chains. We have uh, whether it's consumer end result of manufacturing or more of a business to business. There's a very complex web of companies, suppliers, um, and distributors, and manufacturers who are who are here, kind of should we say in the hot seat as this revolution happens. What are, what are the the direct implications to these complex supply chains? What are the policy implications? What what can they do? What should they be thinking? For Brian's question. Oh well, we're we're still seeing that. I I, I don't think there's a full answer to that. What we are seeing is that um, three. By the way, you'll have the full answer by March twenty by our next. Let's go to announce the answer next uh, <clears throat> at the, at the live event. So. What we are seeing, not a full answer to that yet. What we are seeing is that 3D is starting already to show the capacity to do a couple of things. Number one, it's shortening supply chains. Because again, I, I, I can collaborate direct. If, if I'm a producer, uh, I can collaborate directly with the customer on, uh, on design products. I think to me, for the manufacturing supply chain, that is one of the most profound implications. Also, I can produce parts right at the point of distribution, right at the point where um, intermediate goods are needed. So we, you know, it has a different a different implication for what a lean supply chain um, would make. And and I think that um, all of these things are just kind of working themselves out. Clearly, the customer is going to have more power. The customer is going to play a bigger role in the manufacturing and design and innovation process. The, um, the, the nature of innovation in manufacturing is, is going to change because it's going to become more integrated with production. Those are the implications that the geometry of um, a 3D supply chain is starting to show already, but I think we need a little more time before we go deeper into, into, the, um, into the woods to see where how all of this is going to fall out. It, it, it's a consolidation of supply chain. It's a greater um, power for the customer. It's a greater emphasis on um, innovation and design, and um, it's a capacity to change lean because you can put, you know you can 3D print parts where, right where they are. So just in time means nothing. It collapses to just in time becomes just right there. That's what we're starting to see um, more as and more more as this develops. Brian David Johnson, how possible? I mean, when, when does this inflection point can't happen? When does just in time become just there? And, and at a practical level, whether it's <clears throat> I need a you know I need a it's a transmission in my car. Indeed, anyone will ever do that ever again in their lives, or or manufacture that specialized wrench that I need to do that particular. When does this when does this happen? And, and more importantly, perhaps does this happen in the home? Does this do we become the manufacturers of uh, of just their manufacturing for the, some significant portion of the objects we need in our lives? Does this become again to this this intermediation of the supply chain? We go down to you know we go down to the, you know there's the Amazon box. We could go down to our local print box just pick up that thing we did that uh, was manufactured that morning for us. We're, when, when, do these, when do these changes happen in some reasonable time frame? So I think first we should start with saying, it goes back to your question, is that does this come into the, to the home? I'll answer the, what is that inflection point here in a, in a minute. Does it come into the home? Well, I think it goes back to, do we want it to come into the home? And again, I use the correlation between uh, desktop publishing and printing. Right, there were things that we, there are things now that we that we print out in the home. Many, many things we print out our boarding passes, we print out lists, but there's some things we don't. You know, there's some greeting cards, and there's even some books that so some people still like to buy physical books. Maybe they, maybe they actually like to read it on an e-reader, and they don't actually print it out. That becomes a question, I think, of how much the consumer wants to become a manufacturer. 
Because right now, if you think about when it comes to, say, a piece of furniture, sort of, let's, uh, subtractive manufacturing, right? Because what we're talking is about additive manufacturing. 3D printing is really just additive manufacturing. That's new, but we've had subtractive manufacturing for a very long time. It's called woodworking in one way. And some people have massive woodworking shops in their home. Some people love to make tables and chairs and make things, and that's where they get their joy, and they make that decision. Some people are frightened to go anywhere near a bandsaw, and so they simply go down to the local store or a big box store and buy it. So for me, though, that's a wonderful thing because it becomes about choice. What does the consumer want? And additive manufacturing is going to start allowing people to say, you know, maybe I do want to print that, that spare part, or maybe I do want to come up with a new um, piece of art or a new design, and they want to do that in their home. Now, when it comes to that inflection point, that, I think, is, is something I talked about kind of earlier on, where we're beginning to see that the different viable business models. There was just a, a report out a couple weeks ago that not the, the local print shop or the local shipping shop, whether it be a UPS store or a local like Home Depot store, are starting to have 3D printers. Also, some uh, libraries, local libraries, are starting to have 3D printers, and these are becoming kind of the locus because there's enough people who can come and use it that it becomes to be financially viable. And so I think that's what you start to look for is where does it become financially viable and we're starting to see it happen. We're starting to see it happen. But when it comes to the direct approach to manufacturing, and, and, and this I think is incredibly important, I think there's two areas. One is what I said earlier is what are we printing? Meaning that additive manufacturing, what's the material? Because Again, if you can only print in plastic, you've now limited what you can actually do from a design standpoint. But when you can actually have meaningful metals, meaningful composites, then it actually does become very, very viable. And I think there's a lot of research going on. And I think over the next five or ten years, you're going to be beginning to see some of that coming out of the universities, coming into these different startups to see where that's actually um, uh, becoming viable. But I think one of the things which we haven't mentioned on this panel, which I think we would all agree with, is something that has to happen with 3D printing, is it literally has to break out of the box. Right? We always hear people talk about thinking out of the box or getting out of the box. Right now, so much of 3D printing exists in that box. It could be a very small box, it could be a very big box, but the additive manufacturing actually... And one of the things, especially when it comes to large-scale manufacturing, when it comes to architecture, it's breaking additive manufacturing out of that box and actually getting it into the enterprise scale, something that is much, much larger. And I think that's something that really needs to happen sooner than later. Well, what's, what's, what's holding that back? I just, but before I want to understand a little bit more his point. What, I mean, when you say getting out of the box, you're talking about large, large size, large scale, large volume specifically or, or more just you know taking it from we're manufacturing widgets and spare parts to we're 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 gonna print an entire car and, and you can drive it out of the out of you know drive it out of your garage once you've printed it uh, you know overnight and, and, and get right well and one of the things holding us back from printing a car right now is it just the the cost it's actually it's less expensive to go and buy a car down the street than to actually print it um, and again, this, these will be addressed sort of as it goes forward. And, but to answer your question, you know, from a volume standpoint, we're getting there. There's, again, not only the local shops, but then there's also the, the 3D printing on demand shops that are spread out all over the world. They're beginning to solve the demand problem and, and pulling that into shipping, and they're doing the hard work of turning this into an industry. I think my point is actually, no, it's a, it's a physical innovation standpoint. And, and there's some people who are beginning to do it where you're actually being able to, from a scale, you're being able to do, when it makes sense, large-scale additive manufacturing that's not confined to these small little boxes, that we're actually thinking of it in a way where it's not 3D printing, it's additive manufacturing, and it lives on that enterprise scale. Can I, can I, uh, Josh, can Please, I Claire. embellish that with one simple, I, I, I want to agree with Brian and embellish it with one simple piece of economics that uh, I, I think often gets mixed. Think of how much greater, the because of 3D printing's existence, think of how much greater the return on the investment of a given supply chain, a given production chain is. It used to be that a, any given you know, factory, any given production chain was geared toward the production of one product or a closely knit allied a group of products. If you wanted to use that production chain uh, to make different products, you had to retool. But with 3D printers, 
you the, the same three 3D printer that makes chess pieces can make airline parts. So conceivably, you have the production chain, the supply, the shortened supply chain, the return on investment of it becomes all the more valuable because it's so much more flexible. Oh, you know, we want to make tools and food. We have 3D printers. We don't have to retool the whole uh, whole line. And therefore, I mean, that simple bit of economics, as it plays through the market mechanisms that I think 3D printing is already starting to push into place, it will, that by itself, push this out of the box. That's going to be, I think, one of the biggest drivers of getting this out of the box and into the industrial process. That simple bit of economics. No need to retool for different products, or not completely, anyway. Right. And, but, but, I mean, as... as Freeing is that obviously will be on the one hand. It's going to be very, uh, going to, it's going to change dramatically the, the the notion of any specialization whatsoever in manufacturing. And I think there's a whole, you know, second and third tier in the manufacturing supply chain that's highly specialized. In, and, and you know, this is how it's organized today. I mean, they are you, know, you you as a second or third tier manufacturer probably belong to you know, sell up through only one or two specific, maybe three specific. Vertical industries, aerospace and defense, uh, you know, electronics. Um, you, you may be in, in some version of durable goods because you're selling certain products. You're not going to be that expanded. You're not going to have the connection, the understanding that that closeness, proximity to the customer, because you're not saying the customer can be anything, anybody in any supply chain whatsoever. So I think I think that's going to be very disruptive to a lot of smaller manufacturers who are just living in this. I, I do aerospace and defense. I, I sell to. You know, I'm part of the Boeing, you know, Dreamliner supply chain. That that's my my thing. Um, so I, I, I think it cuts both ways. I don't think that's necessarily the case. One of the things that the U.S. manufacturing sector has as a competitive disadvantage, something that we are lacking in, that for example, China or a lot of other large emerging markets does, is contract manufacturers. China is, is very, very good in that. Manufacturers that are become third-party outsourcing for specific kinds of production, who have expertise in specific kinds of production. Uh, the fact that China has a lot of them, we are, are lacking in them, has been a competitive disadvantage for us. So, you know, sort of thinking through this, with 3D printing, we might have more of, of, of startup contract manufacturers who um, who can use the, the the technology to become all the more, the more less expensive um, and and therefore their existence might grow in this country. So yes, I agree with you that supply chain is no longer specialized, but at the same time <coughs> we may have excuse me we may have more small contract manufacturers using the advantages of 3D printing to come into the uh, into the supply chain matrix. You have a point. I think I have a point with contract manufacturing. This is early in the evolution, but these are the issues to watch economically. Um, we've had a couple of questions coming in on the Twitter feed. And I want to I want to get to them because we're coming up on the uh, 15-minute uh, mark here. Um, and maybe I'll start with with the first one. And, and uh, maybe Brian Gaff is our resident um, lawyer and attorney and and an engineer. You might be able to take a swipe at least part of this. One of the questions comes in is, you know, can we talk about some of the issues with 3D printers regarding specifically reliance on plastics, unhealthy gas emissions, gun control loopholes? Maybe I'll I'll translate to that. We have we have both health and regulatory issues that we try to impose on large scale manufacturing. Um, that suddenly, how do we deal with that in the home if we're we're doing that? You know, can we can we regulate? I mean, my I, we bought my nephew a, a 3D printer when he graduated, got his graduate degree in, in um, engineering. And first thing we did was try to figure out which of the, you know, which of the plastics were actually something he wanted to be inhaling on a regular basis. Um, we don't, we don't, we allow, we we have certain, a lot of regulations about about worker safety in large factories. How do we deal with that, uh, Brian Gaff, in, in a smaller scale? Can we deal with that? That's an interesting question. Um, Obviously, as you said, there are regulatory frameworks uh, that exist today. 
uh, for all sorts of industries, for all sorts of uh, types of products that might be manufactured, not necessarily uh, just firearms. Um, and you also have uh, environmental and, and, and safety related regulations that uh, apply to manufacturers. How much wastewater can they discharge and things of that sort. Um, I, I, what's interesting about the 3D printer uh, uh, concept as it over, overlaps with these, these regulatory structures is that on the surface the 3D technology allows more people to get into more sophisticated types of manufacturing, right? I mean, there, there's always have been garage operations, and and um, maybe what you could accomplish in a garage um, uh, was limited to a certain degree, and may, maybe some of those limitations go away when you have the capability to produce uh, any type of 3D object, uh, uh, or virtually any type of 3D object that you want to produce. and I'm not sure the regulatory framework has to change uh, to to specifically address 3D. I mean, I think you can think about it just as the regulatory framework addresses anything as it exists today, irrespective of its size for the most part. Um, you, you know, certainly uh, any types of hazards that might uh, be a byproduct of the actual 3D printing uh, process, you know, some type of gas emission or some type of uh, hazardous runoff waste and so forth. Uh, I, I, I suspect that, that uh, you know, any type of hazardous runoff is something you can't put down your sewer in your home, irrespective of, of uh, how it gets generated. And uh, I think the regulatory framework addresses that. I, I think what it, what, what happens though is if to the extent you may be exposing yourself as a 3D printer user to uh, more of these regulations because for the first time maybe you are producing some hazardous type of materials uh, that you never would have had the ability to produce previously. Uh, so I think it becomes incumbent on the end user and maybe to some extent on the 3D uh, printer manufacturer and the supplier of the 3D uh, printer raw materials, the consumables, to educate the end users as to what some of their obligations are as to uh, uh, regulatory compliance. Uh, it, it's, it, it's a, frankly, it's a real hornet's nest when you start thinking about particular products and how those products might be regulated. Uh, the question, you know, raised firearms is, is a good example and, and I'm sure we could put our heads together and think of all sorts of other products that uh, have certain regulatory uh, uh, limitations applied to their manufacture um, and it's a question of how d does the end user, uh, is the end user familiar with those regulations or are they just going to go off on their own and uh, not uh, uh, accept the fact that they're going to have to educate themselves ahead of time of what is and what is not um, uh, acceptable. Uh, this may be an issue for uh, an IEEE or, or a trade group to try and address some sort of high-level guidelines of, uh, about what is and isn't uh, acceptable in industry, what is and isn't uh, uh, subject to uh, regulation, at least based on the current regulatory framework, um, but it, it really is a, a case to some extent of a catch-up. Yeah, Brian David Johnson, I'm, I'm thinking as, as Brian Gaff is talking, I'm a rogue state, I want to, uh, <clears throat> I want to refine some uranium, uh, I'm going to print my centrifuge uh, material, the heck with DuxNet and anybody trying to stop. Um, what is, <clears throat> as you look in the future, what are, what are some of these ethical moral regulatory issues and how do we, we have this generation that's looking, as you said, postulating, these people are thinking out of the box in terms of IP, are they also, I mean, what, what box are they thinking out of in terms of some of these other issues? Well, um, I'd have to actually add on to what, to what Brian was saying, is that, you know, a lot of the regulatory and legal frameworks that we've had um, are pretty effective, and, and, and what I mean by that is, I'll go back to my, my analogy of the, of the hammer. So, you know, as I said, technology 3D printing is just a tool, right? It's just a hammer. And you can't make a hammer sufficient enough to build a house that is also not sufficient enough to bash somebody's head in. You just can't do it. That, that by design, that, that the tool itself 
you is there inside of it there's there's these sort of intrinsic things that you, to be able to make it be meaningful you can't protect it so but one of the things that we have and that actually that that our society has had and even our global societies have is we have laws we have culture we have ethics we have morals that surround us and surround us in our and our culture that say using a 3d tool using I mean using that 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 hammer to build a house is a good thing. Using it to bash somebody's head in is a bad thing. And and we've actually, as a society, been able to build these backstops around it. So it's a generally it's not a technology problem, right? The technology again is simply a tool, but it's us having looking at the regulatory, looking at the legal frameworks, looking at our cultural and ethical frameworks that surround the technology to say, do they hold up? And I think we're right in the middle of that. Actually, evidence to the fact fact that it actually came around is it sufficient We're in the middle of doing that the way that we figure that out the way that we figure it out as engineers as communities as people is we have these discussions they become public discussions and I think that's what we're beginning to see happen right now and that's actually what has to happen there actually is no one single right answer but we do have a very robust culture a global culture of all these things that actually will allow it to backstop it yeah. Well, I'll be a little bit skeptical, and and then and take it into our next our next topic, which is we have these systems in place already, and and here we are you know, desperately trying as a global you know, economy and culture to grapple with the tremendous amount of hacking and cybersecurity issues that, despite all the laws and regulations on, on you know in place today, none of them were written anticipating the scale, the quality, and 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 <clears throat> And frankly, the success rates that some of the, the cybersecurity hackers are, are having in the world, no one, no one thought we could really be that vulnerable. Uh, or maybe we thought there were many who thought none, none, none chose to deal with it until, until now. And I want to bring that into you know that whole cybersecurity issue up now for our panel. I mean, we we have a lot of new processes, we have a lot of new technologies, uh, we have a manufacturing world that's now. As we move to 3D printed, by definition, much more interconnected than it ever has been. Most traditional shop floors are have internal Ethernet and other connectivity, but they're not connected necessarily out into the, the wide world um, uh, of the internet. Whereas 3D printing will, by definition, be. What are the implications? What does this mean for security and and, and safety uh, and, and safety in particular going forward as as we try to try to sort of you know, tame this beast or, or unleash it, whatever we want to say. And Cliff, why don't you, why don't you take that first? Well, it's not, let me point out that it's not just uh, 3D printing that's creating the hazard. Uh, manufacturing is, is, is implementing a lot of new and interesting technologies. One of them is, is what's loosely called smart manufacturing, which basically, in a very basic sense, is uh, a factory that's run by software, which has all kinds of efficiency and interesting advantages of it, uh, to it, but just think about the cybersecurity aspects of a factory that is written by software. Let, let me let me say a couple, two things, and uh, neither one of them is overly useful now, but we have to think it, uh, it it's true. Uh, for one thing, progress is risky. Any good progress is risky. We, I, I think we're just going to have to do the best I can we can, and and uh, realize the great benefits of taking these strides are also going to have a great um, great risks. But also, cybersecurity. We, we um, well, uh, you know, at Maypi, we've been running forums for uh, to make our, our members aware of cybersecurity. But it, for manufacturers, it creates an, an innovation um, opportunity. It creates the capacity for them to think through how do I create cybersecurity type technologies? What, what, what are the products and services that I can offer on the market? For um, for cybersecurity and maybe some of these new technologies, as we begin to use them effectively and efficiently, have within themselves the capacity to produce that that technology that can quickly detect that hacker hacker that can quickly um, pull back that 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 dangerous um, element that's attacking your supply chain. So I know that's not very helpful, but we have to realize that taking these steps forward is important. And for manufacturers with these new technologies and a lot of imagination, it creates the capacity maybe to innovate on cybersecurity, to give us cybersecurity solutions. 
Okay, and we've got about five minutes left. I want both Brian David Johnson and Brian Gafter just add their words of wisdom on this subject before we wrap up. Brian David Johnson, go first. Cybersecurity. What's what's your what's your take? Well, you know, certainly in my job as a technological futurist, it's it's something that we've um, we've been thinking about quite a bit. Um, and for us, it's always going back and starting to understand from a, from a data and a privacy standpoint, getting an understanding that we're building the networks to understand, you know, what it is. One of the things that I think it challenges us as well, I mean, the, the, especially the type of hacking that we're talking about these days really hasn't been around for very long. People have been talking about it, but it's really only the past couple years that this type of, of security has gotten real, real. And, and again, I think you begin to see us sort of working through that. I think one of the things that I found very interesting, especially as I look out, is really redefining how we think about security. We came to, to cybersecurity thinking that it's sort of a lock and key. It's either secure or it's not secure, or it's a, a moat in a drawbridge. It's either okay or it's not okay. And what we're beginning to see, especially with these massive complex networks, is that cybersecurity is far more complicated than that. And until we change how we think of cybersecurity completely, that we're not going to be able to solve it. Brian Gaff, what's your what's your take on that subject? Uh, yes, interesting point. Um, particularly as the factory, the software defined factory that Cliff mentioned earlier, uh, the cybersecurity issue. A couple of things that come to mind with me right now, and then they all sort of point into the liability issue. Certainly, there's the data breach issue that we've all seen happen uh, to uh, large scale uh, consumer oriented uh, uh, stores or, or health insurance companies most recently. Um, to the extent uh, you get these types of data breaches in, in the 3D world, I'm thinking more on the lines of manufacturers who might be relying on 3D printing as an integral uh, part of their manufacturing process. If, if they lose some of their data that puts them at a competitive disadvantage. It, it's uh, they might be targeted by nefarious parties who are either competitors or who want to do them harm in other ways. Uh, not to mention anything that might come from overseas through a terrorist type of uh, attack. Um, you also have the potential of systems in in being infiltrated and and perhaps. Uh, being reconfigured to produce, uh, this may sound far-fetched, but it's a possibility, possibly uh, a, uh, almost like a virus type effect inside uh, a manufacturing process where the actual uh, 3D part of the manufacturing process might be compromised in some way that is very difficult to detect. And uh, cybersecurity, to the extent uh, people start looking at 3D as an alternative manufacturing process or something that they can reconfigure on the fly with limited tooling, uh, that has to be very carefully addressed because of uh, the potential of, of uh, certain types of activity that could really uh, create liabilities for the company. Great. Well, on that note, um, I want to I want to thank you all. Thank you, everyone. Participating, we have a couple of closing slides, and with the um, by the grace of Google Hangout, I'm going to just want to queue up the um, next um, our, our live event. Uh, first, first of all, if you would like more information, particularly on the live event, uh, which is coming March 17th, I think that's the 24th. That's one of our other ones. Uh, please, please check in with us, and by all means, follow us on social media. And I want to again thank our three panelists, Brian. Cliff and Brian, uh, for your time and all of you who were able to join us today, uh, please come to the live event next month. Thank you very much.